We wrap up now with a wrestler, uh, has a career at St. Paris Graham. If you know wrestling, it's a pretty good school. Troy Christian, another pretty good school, and now he's at the University of Finley. Uh, you're going to enjoy Cody Omnis. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Um, yeah, let's uh, actually one more hand for these testimonies. Come on. That was great. These four did an awesome job. So, like he said, I don't want to talk too much about me. Um, I'm not the spotlight for the night. Jesus is, and that's what we're going to get into. Um, I'm Cody Onmes. I'm, uh, I'm a wrestler at the University of Finley. I help lead FCA. And uh, I came to my faith at a young age um, with my parents. Um, you know, by the bedpost, like a lot of us did, uh, asked Jesus to be my Savior. Didn't know what it really meant. So, when I was 15, I decided that I really wanted to pursue a passionate, intimate relationship with Jesus. So I decided to be baptized, and from there on, I've tried to live by faith ever since. So tonight, we're going to wrap up the last 15 minutes or so here. I won't try to keep you guys too long. Uh, we're going to wrap up by talking about Jesus. We're going to dive right in. I'm going to get a little deep with you to start, but stay with me. I promise you'll follow me. Here's where the story starts. Everybody's familiar with this. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And God said, let there be light. Let's go to the other book of the Bible that starts with, in the beginning. For those of you who don't know, it's the Gospel of John. Okay? And it's crazy to see how these relate right here. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The crazy thing that people don't get, that people miss, is... The word, word, you follow me in that context? The word, word, okay? In the, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That comes from the Greek word logos, which means spoken word. So originally written, we can read it like this. In the beginning was the spoken word, and the spoken word was with God, and the spoken word was God. Let's go back to the beginning in Genesis, and we, we're going to look for that spoken word. We see it in verse 3. God said, let there be light. That was Jesus. Jesus was that spoken word. And the idea is that he was there in the beginning. And that's important because he paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. And we'll get into that. Um, we're going to take a few moments now. We're going to quickly, and I mean really quickly, walk through the life of Jesus. Because you can stand up here and talk about what he did for hours. We're going to briefly touch on what he did. So we can get a better understanding of who he was and what he did for us. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much again for this amazing night, Lord, and for all the blessings you've given to us. Um, Father, we just uh, we know that when two or more gather in your name, there you are with them, Lord, and we believe that tonight. We believe that you're here, Father. God, we just pray that whatever words are spoken here, that they're just directly from you, Father, and that you reach people tonight. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Jesus, the virgin birth, right? Everybody believes it. We see it in John 1, 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. From there on, he's raised by Joseph and Mary. And as he's launching into adulthood, about 30 years old, keep in mind his ministry didn't go that long, but he did a lot of awesome things. Just a few years, right? A few years of ministry. We continue from there. When he's launching into adulthood again, he's baptized by John. He then is tempted by the devil which was touched on earlier, and of course, he resisted, something we couldn't do. He begins to preach the first documentation of that's in Matthew 4. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. After that, he goes on, calling his disciples, healing the sick, and he gives his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthews 5 through 7. Fantastic set of morals and values to live by. From there on, he finishes up his ministry with all of his great leadership, his teachings, uh, his parables, prophecy, and these miraculous things he did. Raised a man from the dead, opened blind eyes, opened deaf ears, just did these amazing things. All of them brought hope. He gave us hope. And one day, his disciple Judas approaches him with a mob behind him. And they arrest him. And he knew that was going to happen. But they arrest him. They put him on trial. They bring him to Pilate, the governor. And at the time, Pilate... It was on Passover. This Sunday was Passover, right? And that was the holy day. And the tradition for the Jews on that day was for Pilate to release one of the prisoners on death row. 
Pilate saw this as an opportunity. He had a heart for Jesus. He knew Jesus wasn't a criminal. He knew he was innocent. So what he did was he took the worst of the worst criminal to put up against Jesus and have the people choose. He asked the people, who do you want, Jesus or Barabbas? All we know about Barabbas, for anybody that doesn't know, is he was this notorious criminal, a murderer, literally led a rebellion against Rome. But the people still said, free Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Pilate even asked him again, he said, are you sure? Clearly this man's done nothing wrong. And they just screamed even louder, crucify Jesus. And so it was. Jesus was sentenced to be crucified instead of Barabbas. And what blows me away, what really, really gets to me, is he didn't say a word. He didn't fight it. He didn't plead his case. He didn't get angry because he knew the will of the Father. (laughs) He knew that the Father needed to treat Jesus like Barabbas so that he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. So we all know what happens from there. He takes his cross. He walks up the hill. He's beaten, he's ridiculed, he's mocked, he's laughed at. The crown of thorns is put on his head, he's raised up on the cross, and he's killed. The reason that had to happen in the first place goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. God gave them one rule. He said, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because death is the result. And what did they do? They chose death. They ate from the tree. And they chose death, thereby they chose death for all of us. For all of humankind, sin into the world, and everything was now imperfect. And I tell you what, it's a good thing we live in a world that's unfair. Because if we lived in a world that was fair, in that moment, God would have brought his wrath on Adam and Eve, and he would have punished them. But instead, he did the exact opposite. And this is where we see that scandalous grace that God has for us. He said, I love them, and I want to spend eternity with them. So instead of punishing them, I'm, I'm, they need a savior now. I'm going to send my only son. So he sends Jesus to do what we couldn't do on our own. Jesus dies on the cross for us. Three days later, he rises from the dead. The tomb was empty. Death was defeated. And Jesus had conquered the grave. It's the greatest love story ever told. God gave his son as the free gift of our salvation because he loves us so, so much. Even though we all deserve that cross, Jesus took it because he was the only one that was worthy of it. So now let's jump into the gospel. What do we do? Well, three things to keep in mind. First off, accept Jesus as your Savior. I think a lot of us are already there. But how do we really do that? How do we accept Jesus as our Savior? It goes right into the second thing. It's by faith. We have to live by faith, believing that Jesus died for our sins because he wanted to give us grace, and he knew that we weren't able to save ourselves. He lived just like us. Jesus came down and took on human form. He lived flawlessly because we can't. He resisted the devil's temptation because we couldn't. We failed in the Garden of Eden. He defeated death because we can't, and he took our place on that cross because he loves. The third thing to keep in mind, we see it in John 14, 6. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That third thing is that there's only one way to heaven. One way to heaven, and it's through Jesus. And he says it clearly, and honestly, it's the hardest thing for us to get. It's our biggest problem. We so often are, go through this life thinking that we can do things on our own. I talk to people all the time that tell me they're struggling with their faith because they, they're living by sight. And I ask them, well, what are you doing to overcome it? And they say, oh, I'm just working hard to get myself out. And I just go, what? That's the exact opposite of what the gospel teaches. You know, Jesus, God tells us to give our sins to him, but still people think, oh, I'm going to shake myself free. And I say, stop it. No, you won't. You're no match for the temptation of sin. And it's, it's tough. It's really tough. We're no match and we'll never overcome it because there's no answer within yourself. There's only one. He's the one that took our place. He's the one that stood silently on the platform with Pilate and said, yes, let him take Barabbas. I'll go. I'll go pay the price. He's the one that was there in the beginning. He created everything you see around you, the person to your left, the person to your right, and the person that you are today. He became flesh, gave the ultimate sacrifice. And now all we have to do is give him our sins. And when we mess up, we're forgiven because he loves us. But it is hard. It's not easy. 
It's hard because we get so caught up in this world. We become reliant on ourselves. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us we live by faith and not by sight. But we do the exact opposite all the time. We live tangibly by what we can see in front of us, what we can hear, what we can feel. And it's really, really hard to put all your eggs in God's basket because you can't see him. It's strictly by faith. But that's what we have to do. We put so much stress on our focus and on our discipline and on all these other things. But the reality is our greatest challenge is just to simply believe the gospel. Believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. And in that moment when we receive our salvation and we're filled with forgiveness and grace and love, I can't help but picture Jesus going up the hill to take his place on the cross that I deserve. And I stand here and a free man and all the attention is turned to him now and the love of God says, go son, live your life. I'll pay your price. And 2,000 years ago that happened and I stand here today in 2017. The answer is still the exact same. It's still Jesus. It'll always be Jesus, and it'll never stop being the power of Jesus. His blood is the answer to your salvation, and his blood is sufficient to sustain you through any challenge, any trial, any temptation, or any sin you might come through. Jesus is enough. It's got to be a lifestyle. The last thing, it's more than just believing that there is a God. James James 2, 19 through 20 tells us, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. It's right there. God doesn't want us to just believe that he exists. He wants us to believe that his son rescued us from ourselves. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. I'm going to ask Alyssa to come back on up and grab the guitar. So tonight, we have a challenge. For anyone in the stands today, no matter where you're at in your faith, no matter where you're at in your walk with Christ, if this is the first time you're hearing the gospel, have an open heart to receive it. If you preach the gospel on Sundays, continue to do that. But I challenge you today, anybody here that has never heard the gospel, anybody here that's just feeling lukewarm and needs to just grow in their faith, Anybody here that teaches every, at FCA every week and, and has that passion for Jesus, anybody here that wants to take the next step in their faith, that wants to continue to grow with Christ in any way possible, whether it's to accept the gospel tonight or whether it's to simply make a commitment to yourself, I challenge you today to come step on this field.
Just look around you. Look at all these people. These people that love God. And we're still walking. <laughs> All right. Join me in prayer. Father, we come to you tonight. And we realize you're the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And while this world says, who is he? Does he really exist? We know who you are. And we have faith tonight that you are a God that loves us. And you created each one of us to do something in this world for you. And tonight, Lord, you've spoken to us in different ways. You've encouraged us. You've inspired us. And now, Lord, as we wake up tomorrow morning and go to school, let us not forget what you've said to us. Let us act on it. Let us be a light not because of what we do, but because of who you are. Father, we love you tonight. We give you the praise. And now we're ready to go. In Jesus' name, amen.